Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Stetson, and I'm the executive director here at the Erie Canal Museum. Thank you so much for joining us today. The impact of the Erie Canal was immense, socially, economically, and politically. Today, we will hear about a body of water that was really transformed by these, this impact of the Erie Canal, Onondaga Lake. This is our sixth lunchtime lecture of 2022, with this year's theme being infrastructure. This program was funded in part by Humanities New York with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our next lunchtime lecture is on July 21st. It will also be a hybrid event with both in-person and virtual options. That lecture will fe feature Chittenango Landing Canal Boat Museum's Pamela Vittorio, who will look at the lives of several of the waymasters who worked right here in the historic 1850 Syracuse Waylock Building. Also, as we begin to enjoy the summer, we're happy to promote the return of our popular Beers, Bikes, and Barges series. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. It's happening in nine different locations all across the Canal Corridor. People who register for this event will get a one-hour interpretive tour of a canal community, followed by a beer at a local brewery, which is included in the ticket price. The series kicks off just next week in Albany, beginning and ending outside of the historic C.H. Evans Pump House Brewery. Um, you won't want to miss this engaging series, which was recently featured in the New York Times. Uh, other upcoming rides include Port Byron on July 7th and Schenectady on July 21st. For those of you who aren't cyclists, but you would still like to get outdoors this summer while learning a little, about, a little bit about history, our outdoor walking tours of downtown Syracuse are back as well. Every Saturday, we'll alternate between our downtown Syracuse Erie Canal tour, looking at the historic canal structures, which can still be seen today, uh, and then our Pathway of Resistance tour, which examines Black history along the canal. Those tours will begin at 10.30 a.m., and you can pre-register on our website. The historic tour, or the downtown tour, will also happen every other Thursday at, at 10.30, and I hope you can make it for those. And now, on to our main event. Honeywell continues making progress on recreational projects under the supervision of federal agencies and with state and local governments on sustainability projects that could bring renewable energy opportunities for former industrial properties. In addition, more than 90 acres of restored wetlands are providing a sustainable habitat to nearly 290 wildlife species who have returned to the lake shoreline and nearby areas. Shane Blavelt, I did it. <laughs> Honeywell's senior remediation manager will provide an update on these initiatives and what the community can expect to see in the coming year. So please join me in welcoming Shane. I will much. pass this mic to you. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for allowing me to come speak with you today. Um, this, as you alluded to, this presentation focuses both on recreational and sustainable projects coming to the Onondaga Lake uh, area. A um, little bit more about myself. Uh, as you said, Shane Blauvelt. I'm Honeywell Senior uh, Remediation Manager responsible for implementation of the projects here in the area. Uh, I grew up in the Southern Tier. I've been in New York my whole life. I uh, grew up in the Southern Tier, Waverly, New York area, went to college in upstate at Clarkson, and then settled halfway between here and Syracuse. So I've been here over 20 years. Uh, so a local resident uh, that loves to, to see the improvements to the area. And over my 20 plus year career, you know, I've worked on various projects throughout the state, but it was always extremely rewarding to be a part of projects here locally, to see the improvements, to see the progress, and to have however small a part in it. Uh, it's it's really rewarding, and I think you'll agree when you see you know some of the projects that have been implemented by the teams. Um, it's been really stellar progress under prior leadership, including John McAuliffe, who's joined us here today, Steve Miller, and other uh, management at Honeywell, as well as the agency, uh, the various agencies, New York State DEC, EPA, uh, local stakeholders have all had input in this process. Uh, overall, that's contributed to the success. Get this to work. I can just do this if people don't. Maybe. Sorry about this. Should it maybe, Let's should see if it, I thought it was there we go. Okay, so just one slide on 
20 year plus history uh, related to the lake cleanup specifically. Um, you know, that 20 year history included investigations determining, you know, what kind of impacts were out there and how to address them, right? And Honeywell always had a real focus on keeping what we could here local. So that's local labor and talent, that's local sourcing of materials associated with the, the investigations, the cleanup and the restoration process overall. The, re the re remedy itself included over 2 million cubic yards of dredging, which was accomplished via hydraulic dredging. Basically think of a huge underground vacuum that pumps the materials up to a sediment consolidation area where it's now housed and, and contained uh, in a safe manner. Uh, the, it also included over 475 acres of capping in the lake for all those areas that were dredged and additional areas. And as you alluded to in your, your opening, as part of the restoration included over 90 acres of wetlands. And the real you know, success there is seeing over 290 different wildlife species utilizing these restored areas, uh, which is really gratifying. Uh, this remedy is under a monitoring and maintenance program that's a, reviewed and approved by the agencies and is a kind of a continuous monitoring program to ensure that the remedy is, continues to be effective. And then I'll touch on several of these 19 natural resource damages projects that were also implemented as part of this overall program. So I'm gonna do a brief video here. Uh, let's see if I can get this to go. Of course, I can't back. It is called one of the most polluted lakes in America. Most thought it would never be cleaned up. It was written off and labeled as hopeless. But today, it's nothing short of amazing. This is a story of renewal, a story of dedication. This is not another lake. And this, is a comeback story. In 2016, Honeywell completed New York State's dredging and capping plan using technical excellence and innovative approaches. The water quality in Onondaga Lake is the best it's been in more than 100 years. More than 1 million native plants, trees, and shrubs are being planted, creating a thriving green corridor of wetlands. 230 wildlife species call the area home. The community has embraced the turn around too. The lake has gone from an issue to an asset. The Navy Amphitheater brought in more than 200,000 concert goers in its first year. Thousands of people celebrated a renewed lake at the inaugural 2016 Honda Crop Camp. The recovery of this magnitude is only possible in collaboration and through sound science, community, sustainable practices, and commitment to health and safety, the story is taken on a direction few ever thought possible. It's a source of pride and it's a driver for the region. In other words, the lake is back. Let's see if I can do a seamless transition back, maybe. So I'll pause there for just a second. This video, as well as many others, and a bunch of additional information related to the lake cleanup is at www.lakecleanup.com. I'd encourage you, if you haven't been there, to go visit it. There is a lot of great information on that site. <clears throat> so related to the have you know the the restoration or sorry the remediation and restoration itself you know one of the things i think it's really contributed to the success that we've seen with the lake remedy and the associated restoration is that the teams had a lot of forward thinking um you know in the remediation industry it's not uncommon for folks to say what do we need to do to address the contamination that's here and then once you get that plan together, okay, now what do we do as far as how's it gonna be long-term? The team was really focused through input from local stakeholders uh, in the area on what do we wanna see when we're done? What do we want it to be when we're done with the remediation? 
So that was all integrated into the thinking up front and planned for. And I really feel that that's contributed to the success we see. And here's a few photos of some of the restored areas that were directly related to the remediation. Uh, these top two photos are in the Gettysburg Nine Mile Creek area. So just maybe about a mile upstream from the mouth of Nine Mile Creek to the lake. Uh, it's, it's quite a transformation from, for those that are familiar, Phragmites is a persistent problem in the area. It's a monoculture um, of vegetation, doesn't provide much diversity. If you look at what's there now, you've got, you know, a meandering channel, you've got, you know, deep water wetlands, shallow water wetlands, upland areas, a lot of woody vegetation or woody structures out there that the, the animals use and birds and turtles. And it's really uh, something to see. And then the bottom photo is a, a picture from the mouth of Nine Mile Creek heading out to the lake. Uh, so if you were doing the trail, uh, the Loop the Lake Trail, and you're crossing over Nine Mile Creek, that bridge, this is just downstream of that as you enter the lake. You can make out the amputee there in the very uh, right-hand corner there. Again, a lot of focus on integrating the Nine Mile Creek remedy or the lake remedy, and again, the end vision. Separate and distinct from the lake remedy and restoration areas, there's a whole nother process that you go through called NRD, natural resource damages. This, the natural resource damages uh, side of things is governed by a group of trustees made up of re uh, regulators, both from the federal side and the state side. The federal's representative is the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the state's representative is the New York State DC uh, Department of Conservation. The process goes through and looks at what kind of impacts did legacy uh, releases of hazardous materials cause and what, what kind of functions were lost, whether that's ecological function, you know, habitat function, or recreational function, lost fishing days, those types of things. And there's a process by which they go through to assign what's the value of those. Honeywell entered into a cooperative agreement with the trustees to develop the projects that would make up for those lost um, uses of the lake. And I'll, I'll cover several of them, but those, those projects can really be put into two buckets. One would be recreational projects. The other would be ecological projects. So we'll cover a few of them here. In addition to Honeywell and the trustees working together, again, similar thing, engaging the community. What would the community like to see as part of these projects? And one of the resounding things we heard was access to the lake uh, and the surrounding areas. So that'd be like fishing, boat launches, trails, et cetera, as well as enhancements to the habitat and the wildlife coming back. So you can see the list of various uh, stakeholders that have contributed to the process, both upfront in the planning and ongoing as the projects are implemented, designs are done and they're implemented. So I'll run through a few of the projects that have been implemented as part of the NRD process. Um, when the trustees came out and they looked at the success that was a result of the restoration focus in the lake and the surrounding areas, they said, you know, this is great. Let's build upon that. All right. So uh, you'll see that a lot of these projects would be either a supplement to or in other areas doing more of the same. So for instance, in lake fish habitat structures, there's over 2000 structures out there for fish habitat. Um, and Craig and often gets his calls on, hey, can you give me the GIS coordinates for these so <laughs> we can get out there with our, the, for some fishing purposes. But a lot of different types of habitat structures have gone in, you know, boulders, you know, you can see them here, gravel reefs, uh, log cribs, natural structures out in the lake for fish habitat. And then we got a short video here as well, kind of showing some of the fish utilizing the area if we can get it to work. Not sure it's gonna cooperate. <laughs> I apologize. I don't think it's gonna 
collaborate, but it's it's kind of a neat short video about a minute long of some largemouth bass and some small prey fish kind of swimming around one of these crib structures, log cribs that were placed out in the lake. And that video was put together by ESF out there monitoring and ensuring that things are functioning as was intended. And it's been a fabulous uh, relationship we've had working with ESF, as well as, you know, uh, Syracuse University and other, you know, talent pools in the area that have really uh, contributed to everything that's been done out here bringing their expertise and also getting students hands-on experience, coming out, seeing these areas, planting wetlands, getting their hands dirty, monitoring fish. It's, it's really an uplifting process. Uh, another project is the Seneca River boat launch. So as I alluded to, one of the primary things we heard from the community is we want access. We want to be able to get out and enjoy this resource that's been returned to us. So that one of those projects was the construction of the Seneca River boat launch. For those that are familiar, this is right off, it's Hayes Road. So if you were heading to, for those that are familiar, Abbott's Farms up 370 as you head towards Baldwinsville, right when you cross the river there, at first left is Hayes Road. So you can see this boat launch as you go over the bridge there. Uh, this is fully open to the public. It's been open since 2019 and uh, it's a great access point. I like it because it's right down the road <laughs> from where I live. I get my kids uh, out there once in a while uh, to utilize this area. In, a, in addition to this, uh, this, so this is also right near the outlet of the lake. So uh, on a windy day, it's a nice spot to put in if it's too windy out in the main lake area. And you wanted to launch at the Ken Lynch boat launches right off of exit seven off of 690. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen this if you've driven by. Um, it's a beautiful new launch that is operated by the DEC. Uh, there's a lot of uh, parking there for trailered boats uh, to get access out onto the lake. Um, and then this project was actually implemented as part of, not part of NRD. It was done as an environmental benefit project associated with one of our other sites, the Settling Basins 9 through 15. Actually, there's a couple slides towards the end of this related to the sustainable side of a house. Um, but NRD, again, kind of built on that and said, hey, there's some amenities we'd like to add to this. We'd like to add, you know, wash down stations, invasive species boxes, those types of things to, to continue to have synergies uh, related to these interaction between the various projects. Erie Canal Trail. Uh, so this area, is there was a large gap in the Erie Canal Trail, as several folks in here are probably aware, as it went across the state. This is now part of the Empire State Trail. This project connected, so down on this lower left-hand corner of the photo would be Reed Webster Park over in Camillus. So that's an open, right at the base where we picked this up was where you have the open you know, canal section. It extended from Reed Webster Park up over predominantly Honeywell owned property, down under 695, okay? Uh, this is another open section of the Erie Canal Trail. And for those that are familiar, Gearlock is in that area. And I don't know how many of you know Dave Beebe, um, you know, very pa passionate about this area. Um, we've constructed a parking lot right there at Gearlock as part of the project to provide future access so you can uh, go see the area. And then it connected over to Bridge Street. Uh, and there's a lot of nice improvements the village had done there. Connects through State Fair, gets you up over 690 on the pedestrian bridges that connect to the Orange Lot. And you can connect right up with the county's Loop Delay Trail. And then connecting down along the lake shore itself. So I was just discussing over here, here's the connection that that black dotted line gets you down to the Loop the Lake Trail. And then right by the Kenlick boat launch, two slides ago, is, is this area here. This next section of trail, utilizing the same construction method as the county would use for their trail, extended, I believe, is a little over a mile uh, from that area. The boat launch down to what we refer to as Harbor Brook, which is where this stream comes out. Along this section, in addition to extending the trail, 
There's also an angler parking area shown in blue about halfway through that trail section. And there will be a deep water fishing pier that's gonna be extending out right from that uh, parking lot that will provide deep water fishing access in this area. Uh, that should be going in next year at the latest uh, for, for public use. Transitioning more to the, you know, the habitat enhancement side, uh, one of the projects was establish of native grasslands. You know, in coordinating with, again, one of the stakeholders was Audubon, who's very passionate about the area and, uh, you know, birding. Uh, they identified a real lack of native grasslands in the area. So one of the projects was to establish more native grasslands. So this area was identified, this 50 acres is uh, where the materials from the lake dredging were actually consolidated. There's clean cat, there's a bit of really heavy plastic uh, cover over that. It's all sealed in and then, you know, clean material over the top. And we utilize that to establish native grasslands. This is 50 acres contiguous, this kind of square you see, to establish the native uh, species. And it, it's, it's amazing, you go up there, you see birds flying all over the place. And, you know, it's funny time I go up there with Chris Lejeski or others from Audubon, they, they, you can't have a conversation with them because it's, it's constant uh, looking through their binoculars, and, which is amazing. Uh, it's really great to see. Uh, and then there'll be another 50 acres over for those that are uh, familiar with it, the C and D landfill, uh, the Camillus. As that area gets closed, these grasslands, more and more grasslands will be constructed uh, for an incremental 50 acres in those areas. Uh, Hudson Farms in the Nine Mile Creek Corridor. So you can see it in the map up here in the left for orientation. Um, the lake would be in the kind of the up right hand corner of that photo. So this project includes establishment of public fishing rights on over a mile uh, of stream, stream section. We're gonna construct a couple of additional parking areas to provide more access to these sections of the stream. One will be near, oops, sorry about that. One will be at the Amboy Dam right in the town of Amboy. And then the other will be down off of, sometimes I get these two confused, uh, Airport Road, Armstrong, I'm sorry. I got my help in the, <laughs> in the crowd here. Um, that will provide access about two thirds the way down this section, you see that the, the angler, the public fishing rights will be in place. And then in addition to that, areas around it will also be transferred to uh, an, an NGO, a non-government agency that will put it into conservation use and protection, over 210 acres associated with those areas. Before we turn it over, we're doing some additional work to address invasive species. So things that aren't native to the area. For instance, I referred to Phragmites earlier. That is one of the key things that we're trying to address to reduce the amount of them to get more native species in place and growing. And then vernal pools. Uh, these are basically areas that they're wet in the spring. They're in the woods usually. These are where a lot of frogs like to reproduce. The, you know, the tadpoles can be in these wet areas. They don't have fish in there, you know, predatory. So they're able to, to, to grow in a safe environment and then go on to do their thing. Uh, but that's what a vernal pool refers to as these, these isolated areas, they often dry up in the summer, um, but it's kind of a neat, neat thing from a habitat perspective. The lake outlets, the jetties. So these two jetties, for those that are familiar, this is at the kind of the Northern, Northwest end of the lake. There's two large riprap jetties that extend out. So this is at the mouth of the Seneca River. These areas, they have these big shot rock or you know, very large stones, but there's big gaps between them. You know, and this is apparent with young kids, you know, taking them out there, it's, it's kind of dangerous, right? If they were to fall into those, you could really either at best scrape up your leg, at worst, maybe a broken bone. So one of the projects that was identified, a lot of people will go out and utilize these areas for fishing access. Let's make them safer. So the plan is to go out and to fill these gaps 
to make it safer to walk out. In addition to get there, there'll be a connecting trail that connects over the Onondaga Lake Loop to Trake Trail comes right through here. So it'll connect up, there'll be a mulch trail that gets you out to the jetties for, for access. That's on what we refer to as the West Jetty, which is this one. The other one above and beyond that, we're gonna do fill, be filling in the gaps between the, the stones. But in addition, there'll be an ADA compliant walkway up on top to provide access for fishing uh, to that area. You can kind of see a rendering down there in the lower right for what that area will look like. We're working with county parks on you know, the details of exactly where the trail will go, but it'll connect up to the parking area that's right in this area. Again, to provide more access for folks to get out and enjoy the area. So that, those were the projects I wanted to cover that were a part of the NRD process. Kind of shifting to the other part of the presentation related to sustainability. Now Honeywell owns a lot of property in the area and we've been actively looking at how can we introduce additional sustainable solutions to the area. And we do that through uh, several of our buildings, now have solar on top to help you know, offset the, the energy usage in a more green fashion. Uh, we have a project that we're looking at over in Solvay related to um, additional solar panels on one of our uh, former sites. And the big one is related to settling basins nine through 15. These areas for orientation, obviously you can see the lake in the background. It's the south of the lake, the fairgrounds are in this area and then 695 heading south. So this site is actually split between the towns of Geddes and Camillus and it's several hundred acres in size. Looking at what we need to do from our remedial components, as well as, as we're looking at what are some sustainable solutions to do what we need to do related to the site remedy, New York State came out with a Green New Deal, which is focused on renewables within the state and to achieve 100% carbon free by 2040. So, We've worked with, well, let me go to, to the next slide and I'll refer back. In working with what we learned from the native grassland project I referred to earlier, as well as a, a long history of working with SUNY ESF on what are options for closing the site. And really the remedy for the site up on top is to minimize the amount of water, rainwater that lands on the area and goes down into the settling basin, sorry, settling basins, which are calcium chloride. So they get, as water goes through, it gets salty, the chloride piece, right? Um, so we're trying to minimize the amount of water it has able to do that. And one of the ways to accomplish that is to establish a robust vegetative community or a, plants that wanna drink a lot of water, essentially. Take up water in their roots, put it back into the atmosphere, right? It's just, um, they call it evapotranspiration. Okay. Working with SUNY ESF, we had years of pilot studies to establish that these willows that they have come up with can be established to accomplish that goal and do it effectively in a very green and sustainable uh, manner. In addition, you'll see us kind of a circle area here. That was an inland salt marsh. We had a bunch of different species in it. It's a very rare habitat that grows well on this material due to the salty nature, okay? That was a very successful pilot as well, in addition to the willows. So when we saw that the, the, the state's initiatives to, for the solar, as well as the successes of these native grasslands and what we saw in the, uh, the salt marsh, we combined them all and came up with a pilot study working with New York State DEC Region 7 to this is the blue that will be done in these blue areas. That's about 80 acres in those blue shaded areas. Uh, so we're establishing native grasslands throughout the area that then solar panels can be placed on top of to kind of get a double benefit. And so that area is currently being prepped with the hope that solar panels would go in next year and then uh, establish, we, the, the, based on that acreage, it's about 15 megawatts of power, enough for close to 3,000 homes to power them annually. If assuming this is successful and 
looking at, we'll be looking at, does it make sense to build this out further in concert with the agency and other stakeholders? And if you were to do a full maximum build out, it could be close to 90 megawatts of power um, that would be produced if there was a full build out. And this is kind of a recap of a lot of things I, I just mentioned related to this project where you get the benefit of the native grasslands and expanding those areas. They're great for from a habitat or sorry, from a pollinator uh, perspective and habitats. One of the things too, um, it's not on this slide, but I remember I'd done a different version of this presentation before and there's a picture of a monarch butterfly. My wife's like, well, you didn't talk about the monarch butterfly. I said, okay, well, so one of the things, one of the comments we got from people looking at this is, hey, can you integrate milkweed into your seed mix? Because the monarchs love that. So, you know, what a great addition uh, integrated into it. And I had to remember to say that because my wife told me to. Um, <laughs> part of the, um, you know, solution here related to the, it's not just the cover. There's some stormwater enhancements we need to do to, you know, for your really major storms. When you kind of get the water, it just wants to, to flow off that that's collected and manage effectively. And then it goes through each of these, whenever that happens, it goes through points that are monitored. We have sampling programs in accordance with New York DC criteria for uh, ensuring that that water's clean and, and safe as it, it gets discharged. And then we continue to monitor as with all of our remediation programs uh, to ensure that they continue to be effective and protect the community as well as the environment. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Sure. Are those native grasslands that you work with the Audubon to help create, are those open to the public or are those on kind of protected land? So these areas are in, you know, restricted areas. Now, certainly if there was an interest to have a tour, uh, you feel free to reach out to me or Craig and we could arrange something uh, to get up there and see the area. Yes. So I'm, yeah, so I think you're probably referring to what we call the nitrate barge is large blocky boat with a bunch of stuff on it, right? A big barge section. So part of the lake remedy is nitrate addition. So let me back up a second. Um, the, this was a process that's actually unique to Onondaga Lake where Upstate Freshwater Institute developed a process to help minimize the amount of methylmercury that's generated in the lake. So really when you think about mercury, methylmercury is kind of the, the thing that's most concerning because it will get into you know, the fish tissue or, or those types of things. I'll try to, I can't explain this quite as well as some others probably, but we apply nitrate to the deep parts of the lake in the summertime because what happens is there's little microbes you know, that are down in the sediments that their preference is to use oxygen as their energy source, okay? So that's what sustains their life, right? And then if they use up all the action, they transition to different basically food sources. And there's a whole hierarchy on how they get their energy. What we wanna do is keep them from getting to the point where they generate methylmercury through the, their natural processes. The way we do that by, is by introducing nitrate into the bottom of the lake. They use that as their food source. So it never gets to the point where methylmercury is generated into the water column, which helps protect the lake. That really helps the water quality and fish and, and other biota. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> So they've been involved uh, in various capacities throughout the process. Um, early on, Honeywell engaged with them directly um, in discussions related to the lake remedy and the overall process. As we got into the process, they, they preferred to operate on more of a nation to nation 
type uh, perspective, but they continue to be involved in talking with the agencies and providing input on the various uh, technical submittals that go in from Honeywell throughout the process. So they, they provide that input through that process. Any other questions? Right. Eating the fish that are fished out of the lake. I, uh, I know a number of years ago there were signs that went up saying, don't do it. Right. Um, is that still the case? Is there is that a long term forever thing or is the goal that eating the fish out of the lake is something? Sure. As part of the monitoring program associated with the lake, we continue to monitor the fish specifically. There are still, so the the health advisors are, are issued by the Department of Health related to the lake. Um, so you, I don't wanna misspeak on exactly what the current advisory is. Uh, you are allowed to eat depending on, you know, uh, male, female, reproductive years, et cetera. Um, a certain quantity, I would refer to those for the specific, I just don't wanna misspeak. Um, but we are seeing very encouraging trends related to what we're seeing as a result of our monitoring. So if you can envision that we both look at small prey fish, you know, the little guys, the big fish eat um, and the big fish and really the small fish are a leading indicator to what's gonna come in the future. The small prey fish are already meeting the goals that have been established. So, the, and what happens is they, they kind of feed on the much smaller stuff that might live in the bottom of the lake. So that's, that's really encouraging. Longer fish, they're, sorry, the bigger fish have a longer lifespan. So it takes a little longer to see, you know, the continued progress there. We are seeing progress, but you certainly have kind of the generations that may still have been living in the lake before the remediation. But we are seeing occurring in trends and we're seeing them start to get close to what we see in New York state background generally um, across the state. And as you're probably familiar, there are restrictions on most waters in New York state overall. Um, I know the water quality is the best it's been in over a hundred years. From what I've heard, it's safe to swim in the lake. I, I personally, I don't want to, again, I don't want to misspeak. Um, so anybody else feels free to jump in, but I know I personally, I have no qualms of taking my kids down there and being in and around the lake and fishing, waiting, you know, and I wouldn't do that if I was concerned. Any other questions I can answer? No. All right. All right. <laughs> so just to kind of go recap from your project, the things that we expect to see in the next one to two years are those jetties being more accessible, uh, additional, the angler. Um, the deep water fishing deep water pier. Yeah. And then there's one other thing. So you, you hit on two of the big ones. There's a lot of additional habitat projects that continue to happen around kind of the north end of the lake. There's a but wet ones in there and the county parks areas. We're continue to enhance them. Uh, public fishing rights additions in the Nine Mile Creek corridor, um, as well as the addition of some additional parking areas uh, to gain access to them as well. Can you talk about uh, and the, the salt marshes? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not really determined yet. Um, they're both the, the willow specifically, and now the pilot we're doing for the solar are both approved at this point with the agency as far as options to move forward. Um, it's really going to depend on the solar, how successful that is, and then how things look overall. What what makes the most sense for, you know, the, the both the remediation stakeholders and just the big picture. Uh, but it's kind of open and there is an option to depend on redevelopment options. Maybe another option comes up related to maybe an industrial development that might provide the same type of, you know, goal, which is let's say somebody builds a parking lot, the minimized amount of water goes in. That's an option that's out there as well. So none of it's predefined yet, uh, but it'll be an ongoing process. Non-native plant species that are eliminated. 
So it depends which it is. It's a combination of, so for instance, on the NRD program, where we'll go into these areas that are just kind of phragmites, those tall reeds, they're just brown, not real pretty, right? Um, what they do is they go in there and they use this kind of, it's kind of a cool thing, it's called a marsh master. It's like this, it's kind of a halfway between a, a terrestrial vehicle and it's almost like the, the frog, uh, you know, boat you'd see out in Boston. It kind of in between, it goes out, it can go in these areas and it mows down the phragmites. And then they'll come back. A lot of times they're very hard to get rid of. So they shoot up new sprouts really quick. Then we'll apply a herbicide to those new sprouts to try and knock them back, help it get into the roots. And then we soon thereafter would apply native species, you know, seedings and those types of things to help give them a head start to get in there. And then depending on how it's progressing, we evaluate, do we need to, you know, try and address the, the phragmites some more or do we need supplement with native species and kind of, it's kind of an iterative, you know, adaptive process. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you.